I hereby introduce to you, Mr. Michael Veazey. Now, but so looking at the other side of that equation, if I go and look for a product to white label that is an existing design, which is what a lot of us do and is what I've been doing and, and help others to do. Um, what are the best practices for trying to make sure that we don't inadvertently get something that already is somebody else's intellectual property, even though the factory owners will nearly to a man say, it's generic, whatever that means. Right, right. Well, there's a couple of things you can do for also relatively low amount of money. You, you can hire us or another lawyer who's familiar with copyright and trademark to run a search. And for, you know, just for a few hundred dollars, um, you can get an opinion as to whether or not that product is likely to be problematic or you're likely to be okay. It's certainly not an insurance policy. It's certainly not 100% accurate. Uh, you're probably getting 70, 80% uh, protection for relatively low amount of money. You can identify what you think is gonna be problematic and what's not going to be. Um, when you start selling the product, you certainly wanna build in something that nobody else can deliver. Uh, for example, a membership. You're selling like uh, fitness products or fitness clothing, okay, like yoga pants are pretty generic. You may want to also add into it that every quarter that, that customer is going to get a newsletter where they can log on to a system to see certain um, content that other people cannot see. Or you're going to give them a fitness regimen. You want to add something to the product that other companies cannot sell as well, and that's only yours. Let's say you give like a one page fitness routine with your yoga pants. Someone else tries to deliver that fitness routine. Why the pants might be generic and you can't protect them. The fitness routine is copyright. OK, so you're building a, um, a very simple way to put some copyright around your, your product or some IP around your product, even though the product is pretty much not protectable as such. Yes, we had a re we had a really really, really nice man, really good man. And he had bought his company from uh, another man who had a disabled child. I think he was autistic. And what the our client did is that it was like 2% or 2.5% of every sale he would match. And then he'd donate the money in you know every quarter or so to the charity. right? And nobody else could do that. Because even though they might be able to sell you know the same Bic pen, right? Or the same shirt or the same hat. Um, they can't lump the sales with the money from the other sales. So if you were buying that product, you were getting, not only were you getting, you know, the, the yoga pants, for example, you were also getting a donation that was matched with other donations. No, I thought that was brilliant. Yeah, it's a very nice touch. I mean, what if, if somebody else tried to sell the exact same product with the charitable donation angle? Presumably you wouldn't be able to copyright that idea as such. But the customer is not getting the same thing because it's not getting lumped with all the same money. Okay, right. So it's another form of differentiation, but it's not really IP protection as such. Is that right? Oh, no, I, I think it's a very valuable example. Yeah, but it's a very, it's nonetheless, a great, um, very different way of doing differentiation because it's not an idea I've come across. So that's, it's a really, as you say, it builds fantastic good feeling. And I think that's, that's a very good thing to work on. So, so backing off the the so looking around the whole intellectual property thing, um, just more generally around the private labeling uh, way of doing things, which is when you're basically getting products which are so-called generic, although somebody somewhere must have designed them. Um, is there in fact this is one question that I had uh, from a, one of the the guys I've consulted with and had a lot of issues around this. Is there such a thing as a generic product, or is there always an owner of IP somewhere? Um, there certainly are generic products. I mean, if you take like your, your, your plain white t-shirt, it's really a generic cut, it's a generic design, the fabric is generic. Um, so if you take like one of the most generic products you can think of, can you somehow add an IP issue to it? And I, I believe you almost always can. Haynes has taken generic products and made it their own. So what sort of products is Haynes selling? Sorry, I don't even know. That's very ignorant of me. They sell T-shirts, you know, undershirts and underwear and socks. I'm sure all the American listeners are, are banging their heads going like, Mike, why don't you know what Haynes is? But it's not that big in the, in the UK, I think, as far as I know. But anyway. OK, so there can be such a thing as a generic thing. But I mean, it's, it's quite unlikely to exist. So 
Now, tell me, are there others? So we talk about trademarks a lot. Um, how about patents? I mean, there's a lot of discussion that goes around um, the the forums every so often. You know, oh, you can just change one or two things and you can get around a patent. Um, how true is that? And, and what are the main sort of guidelines for us looking at patents for pre-existing products? Not thinking so much yet about how to protect our own, but how to avoid getting um, basically uh, attacked for in infringement of other people's IP. That 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 that's pretty accurate. If you take an existing device and you change it, it's no longer the same exact device, and often you can then beat the patent argument. Um, however, that also has certain limits. And there was a big case that went working its way through the courts. It went to the Supreme Court. Um, Apple versus Samsung. They've been battling for years now. Um, where Samsung used some of the Apple's patented technology within their phone, okay? But the phone was clearly different, but some of the technology was the same. And if you lose that argument, what the court's gonna order is that you have to turn over all of your profits, even though only certain portions of the product violated the patent. Because the theory is you can't, you can't identify why tens of thousands of people or millions of people purchased a product. Was it because of the patent issue or was it because of the differentiation? So on fairly simple products, changing it a bit is often sufficient. On more complex products, uh, it might not be. Um, so really it's a product by product basis. Now just before, before a seller jumps in too deep, you give a call and you talk to a lawyer who knows something about intellectual property as well as Amazon. Um, we often talk to you know do a dozen, dozen and a half people per day. We don't charge them for consultations, but you need to get some idea before you dive in, you know, or put your, your, your nest egg into a product, whether you think you're going to be relatively safe or highly problematic, then you can make a decision. Yeah, it makes a lot of sense. And the thing is that people get a bit cheapskate sometimes about spending money on things that aren't tangible. I and mean, you talk to a lawyer, your bank account's gone down and nothing seems to have changed. But I mean, what you're getting is uh, a percentage increase in the probability of, of uh, good things and a percentage decrease in the probability of bad things, right? And that's, yeah, it's a way of thinking, right? But I, I, I totally would would back up what you're saying in terms of the value of this stuff because having seen firsthand the months of of pain that it causes and it just stops businesses dead. So I, I cannot, yeah, I cannot, but second that. So talking about um, slightly wider things than IP, if we could, uh, I'd love to talk about liability. That sounds like a strange thing to say. And I'd love to talk about liability, but let's talk about liability. Um. Uh, first, one question which may be a bit UK centric for you, but I'll try you on it anyway, because it, it, British lawyers are going to find it just as hard to answer. If you're a UK limited company and you're a sole, um, we'll talk a, about the different options. But if you are, since 2006, you can own and be the principal shareholder of and director of a UK limited company on your own. You don't need any other partners or any other shareholders. Does that form of company offer um, financial and legal protection in the United States? You know, I'm not an expert in that area about the, the international corporations and which one provides protection. I believe that it does. I believe that if you're doing business in the United States, you're going to need to uh, register that corporation or that legal entity in at least one state. Um, but I do believe it will give you the same protection that you have at home, which is to protect you against liability reaching to your personal assets. Interesting. So registering in at least one state is worth talking about, actually. Um, it's a sort of, this is the sort of question that comes up so often, and it's really hard to answer because what is a British lawyer going to know about it? And why would an American lawyer take much time worrying about UK limited companies? So somebody is going to have the answer out there. Um, more broadly, what are the what kinds of liability you are taking the point that you said and um, account suspension is by far the biggest risk, but um, people are always worrying about this, so we have to address this. What are the possible financial liabilities we could be exposed to as product sellers via Amazon? And uh, what other legal liabilities could we possibly be exposed to? Well, Amazon requires you to have a general liability policy. So that would, if you have that policy and you should, uh, we highly recommend Ashlyn Hayden's um, insurance agency. She's here in the U.S., she specializes in, in online retailers, uh, but you should have liability coverage to protect your company's losses, okay? If your product happens to hurt somebody, or a few years back with the, um, the hoverboards, there was a hoverboard that burnt down a very, very valuable home, it was like three and a half million dollar house. 
Now there's litigation about that. We're going to Amazon to try and get that three and a half million dollars back. Um, so I would highly recommend that you buy a general liability policy to protect the company, or protect yourself. If you have a legal entity, that will protect damages reaching to your personal assets. But insurance policy is always a great idea. I think product liability insurance is always a good idea. I think how vital it is really depends on what you're selling. You know, if you're selling, if you're selling T-shirts, chances are uh, there's not going to be many people that are hurt by your T-shirts. Okay. If you're selling items that might be a little bit more um, dangerous, then your risk goes up. And like with any business decision, it's risk versus reward. Absolutely. If I had a pound for every time I said risk versus reward, I think I'd have quite a bit by now. Yeah. Um, great. Well, that, that answers up really. So I mean, it's not a question of what am I exposed to as, okay, what do I need to do to, you know, mitigate the risk and then move on, I guess, right? Otherwise, we'd never leave the house really. But um, one other question. So you've answered one question I was going to ask, which is, is product liability insurance worth it? It sounds like not only worth it, but mandatory. I believe that you have to be turning over $10,000 a month um, before that that requirement kicks in but i may be wrong i mean so it's more possibly just worth getting out of the gate uh another type of insurance that's just beginning to come off the market as far as i know is account suspension insurance is that something you have a view on and if so what what are your thoughts yeah it is it's coming on the market again it's from ashland's office um she has been underwritten by lloyd's of london so you couldn't have a better carrier behind it all and my understanding of it is that they have three different levels of, of coverage for the different types of sellers. You have your private label, you have wholesalers, and you have retail arbitrage. Um, and they're different rates, but depending on what type of business you're in. Um, however the premium works out, what you're covered for, if you're suspended, the company will provide you with $500 to pay you know, my law firm or somebody else to help you with your plan of action. And if you're unable to get reinstated, in 120 hours, they'll start paying your lost profits. And that's, that's the insurance policy that really is what you're buying, um, is the lost profit coverage. Yeah, yeah, I mean, $500 is uh, pretty chicken feed compared to the money you're gonna be losing, but uh, interesting, thank you. Well, I mean, obviously I should talk to Ashley in direct about that, and maybe that's somebody that um, you know we should be in touch with because that sounds very important and relevant stuff for us, but um, that's, uh, that's one of those major areas that people should look into, I think, because, um, I mean, yeah, that's, uh, I don't know what the premiums are, um, but as you say, it's a question of risk reward. The funny thing about risk reward assessments is sometimes people look at the size of a risk and that completely distorts their thinking. Like the idea that you're going to get sued out of house and home because, you know, your, your device catches fire and sets fire to somebody's house is so big. I think sometimes people don't really take account of the fact that it's not very likely to happen. I mean, what's your experience around that? Am I talking rubbish or is this true? I mean, this is my position. No, I, I think you're entirely correct. Um, the the risk of it happening to you, I think, is, is, is negligible on most products. The risk of actually being sued is very, very small. Okay. When, when you buy product liability insurance, you're getting two types of coverage. One is called indemnity which covers the injury of the person that's hurt or their property damage. The insurance also covers defense costs. And most insurance companies will then assign a lawyer to represent you. And having the insurance company assign a lawyer and pay that lawyer is vital to be able to defend yourself. Because you have to pay for that yourself, it's gonna cost you a lot of money and a lot of aggravation. So the defense coverage is also super important in addition to the indemnity. Excellent. Well, I mean, it's both scary and reassuring, really, because it's scary to even take your head out of the sand and consider the possibility of being sued. But I mean, it's great to know that there's a standardized solution which can protect us. So that's great. Well, thank you, CJ. That, that's going to wrap up the first bit, which is when we've looked at the, the main issues, I think. And the next segment we're going to look at is uh, in the next episode, some specific questions that have come through from the listeners. That sounds great.